<laughs> Hi there, and I'm very happy that you could join me today. And finally, we're going to talk about this mystery of healing. What's that all about? So the title of this message is The Mysteries About Healing Revealed. And I, the Lord did, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I didn't, I knew a lot of things having studied the Bible, but I think God pretty well put it together for me this week. And a lot of the mysteries in my own mind were satisfied. So I'll pass those on to you and you can deal with them as you wish. Um, but there are so many questions today about healing. Some of them include, um, are there people today who still have the gift of healing? Some think they do, some think they don't. How can people be healed today? Is there some magic bullet? Uh, the answer to that quickly is no, because if everyone could be healed with a magic bullet, then nobody would be die, uh, dead, right? Nobody would die, and uh, so the answer to that is quickly no. Uh, is sickness a result of sin? Some think so, some think not. We're going to answer those questions, by the way, shortly. Now, what do people die, uh, why do people die if healing works? And last but not least, you have to ask yourself this question. Well, those who claim to be healers, how come they die? I mean, it's a valid question, right? Well, to find the answers, we need only to turn into God's Word, the Bible. And we're going to do just that. Um, I believe that the discovery of sickness and healing is revealed right up front in a verse that the good Lord, thank him, gave me last week, and it kind of shed um, light on one of the mysteries at least, and we can address that question about is sickness a result of sin, or the sins of the parents, or something like that. So in John chapter 9, verse 1 through 3, the Bible says this, here's the scenario. Uh, Jesus passed by in this roadway, he and his apostles, and they saw this man, um, who was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked Jesus, his apostles asked Jesus, Jesus, um, why was this man blind from birth? Was it because of his sin or the sins of his parents? Notice how they only gave him two possible answers. And Jesus kind of surprised them and now us. He says, neither, my apostle friends, uh, why this man was blind from birth is so that God's work could be manifest or made known through this man. And today we're reading what was known about that, so G, about that blind man. And so why he had this blindness or illness from birth. So did God make him blind at birth? The answer to that is yes, and I will explain to you out of God's Word in a minute why I can verify and justify that that is a true saying. So, yes, and God causes this to happen so that it will draw people, like the people close to that blind man, or when somebody that you know, your loved ones, uh, become ill, the first thing you do, come on, Unless you're an atheist, the first thing you do is you run to seek God's face. That's his intent, and he says so a little later on, which I'll show you. So that's his intent. When people get ill, God caused it, and there is a reason for that, and there is no, uh, there's no immediate verse or, uh, like I say, a silver bullet that will allow you to just come and get some oil put on your head or whatever, some magic bullet, and poof, you're healed. Well, he had cancer a minute ago, but you know, he took that magic bullet and look at the guy, he's in great shape, he's, in, he's never going to die. So that stuff there does not happen, but the reason that I wanted to point out to you from God's Word that Jesus himself said is God does this so that the works through that person, whether it's your loved ones or that blind man, would be made known to those around that person who is stricken ill. So let's go off. I start this message off with great news that God does allow sickness, but He also allows for healing. 
So that's a good thing. So now we, we know why people get sick, who causes sickness, and I'll justify that in just a minute. And we also know that God is the one that also can heal. So, you ask the question, does God really, really, really make sickness happen? Yes. If you turned in your Bibles to Isaiah, the Old Testament, chapter 45, verse 5 through 7, you will read something along these lines. God saying to his people, I am God. I am the only God. There is none beside me. I form the light. I form the darkness. And I make peace. And I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. What? You create evil? Evil is not to be taken with the word sin. Sin is the doing of evil. Okay? So God admits to creating evil. And he can also create peace because he just said so. But he creates good and bad. We all know that whoever read the Bible in Genesis knows Adam and Eve and the story about how God created the Garden of Eden and he said, look, everything is fine. You're going to live forever. You have eternal life right now. I just have one itsy teeny weeny rule, Adam, Eve. Do not take of the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge of good and bad, and of course we know the story. Eve says, eh, she listened to the devil. The devil says, you're going to believe me. I say God isn't going to kill you like he said. If you take of that tree, you will surely die. He's really not. You're going to believe me, Satan said. Or you're going to believe God. She believed Satan. And like I said in many messages before, Satan's lie then holds true today. And every time he throws something at you, like even this message, he's going to say, you're going to believe God or you're going to believe something else that somebody fed you along life's highway. Okay, so we know all that stuff from the Garden of Eden. You and I now have the knowledge of good and bad within our spirits. And then our spirits are always telling our soul, which I did this message once too, and our soul tells the body to choose to do good or evil. And we do. We choose to say, well, I think I'll go down that sin road. Or no, nope. the spirit says, no, choose to do good. The soul agrees with the spirit and tells the body, no, nope, let's flee from that. I had to flee from one of those this morning, just to tell you the truth. But I had the power to do it knowing that I can tap into my spirit because I'm made up of a trinity as well, the body, the soul, and the spirit. And uh, my spirit convinced my soul, now nah, don't go down that road. Okay, so we get it. Satan lied then to Eve and he lies to you today. Now, God flat out said this in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 39 out of his word. He said this. You've got to understand this now. He said, see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no other God beside me. Just like he said in Isaiah. But he also added other than he created light and dark and, and peace and evil, he says, I kill, only God can take a life, he's admitting to it right here in Deuteronomy, I kill and I make alive. He had Jesus, his son, raise Lazarus from the dead. He, God, raised his own son Jesus from the dead. Uh, he says, I wound, that means I make ill, I maim, I cause whatever, to happen to people for the reason that I want to make them aware of me, number one, and, and all the people around them aware of me. John, that's cruel. I don't know what kind of a God would do that. Well, God's telling you he's doing it. He's telling you for the reason why. Because if we had no illness in this planet, think about it, and no hurricanes and no tsunamis and no fires, uh, forest fires and none of that kind of stuff, Nobody would be paying attention to God because what would be the reason for it? Come on. Okay, so he says, I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is nobody, nobody on this planet uh, who can be delivered from sickness or whatever else I bring to them. Nobody can be delivered from it apart from my allowing it. That's Deuteronomy. That means, that should tell you right off the bat, the guy on TV that says, look, I'm the great healer, just come to my church, 
or send money, you know, if you send me $15, I can send you this scented, beautiful uh, anointing oil, and you just rub it on your forehead, and voila, for 15 bucks, you're healed. Well, you know what? If a million people sent that guy 15 bucks, that's $15 million that he just earned selling something that shouldn't be sold in the first place. Let me tell you why. There's a story over in Acts chapter 8 about Simon the Sorcerer, Simon the Sorcerer, who I believe also was the father of Judas Iscariot. Why do I say that? Because it says in the Bible, elsewhere in John, that here Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. And there's only, there's, uh, up, I think, seven Simons in the Bible. One evil one is the evil one in Acts chapter 8. Anyway, he comes across Peter and the other apostles, and they're laying hands on people, and they're healing people. And they're putting their hands on people and, and uh, praying that the Holy Spirit would uh, come to them because he had not yet come yet according to Acts chapter 8. So he's witnessing this. He's a sorcerer. He's an evil guy. He is referred to as by his people in, um, I forget where he came from off the top of my head right now. Uh, but anyway, he <clears throat> is revered in his village, if you will, by the people as He's like God. That's why the Bible compares Simon the sorcerer to Satan himself. And that's why Jesus called uh, Judas the son of perdition, the son of Satan. We'll get into that in just a minute. <clears throat> but when God says nobody is going to, what I do, nobody, I'm allowing nobody to be able to go heal that person or make them alive or anything unless I authorize it period. Uh, so this should eliminate anybody like the Charlotte and selling the $15 oil is my point. There are other ones that just say, hey, come, we're going to have a healing service and, you know, put 15 bucks in the plate uh, or 1500 if you have a really serious disease. And then you see them. I've seen them on TV. The guy goes like this. They fall on the floor. They get up. They throw their crutches away. They run toward the back of the auditorium. Voila, I'm healed. And so the rest say, wow, if that guy got healed, I, I got to stand in line here and I got to wheel my wheelchair up there and I'm going to be healed too. Well, Simon the sorcerer saw Peter and the rest of them doing these miracles and he said to them, like these charlatans on TV, uh, if you're a charlatan, forgive me, but you know, you know who you are, but I'm going by what the Bible says, not by what you proclaim. So Simon the sorcerer says, look, hey, this is good stuff. How much, how much de moulin will you charge me, Peter, so I can have this gift? I'll pay. Now, why would Simon the sorcerer pay for this gift of healing or laying on of hands and ushering in the Holy Spirit who would heal and so forth? Do you think he would invest, let's just say, 2,000 bucks for kicks? Here, here's 2,000 bucks, Peter. Let me buy that gift that you got. You think he was just being a, a nice guy and just wanted to donate money to Peter in the first church at Jerusalem? I don't think so. He wanted to go and resell that gift and he could run around and, and have crowds like that were drawn to Jesus and these apostles now after Jesus had uh, ascended into heaven, which is where Acts 8 kicks in. But imagine, then he could sit in this big fancy chair and say, okay, next, that'll be 1500 Boom, you're healed. See you later. Next. Boom. And he thought he would make a fortune. Well, Peter said to him the same thing that God says to the shouting on TV, selling the $15 oil, or doing the magic dance uh, you know, on these healing services. The, the, he says, your money shall perish with you, which means you and your money are going to perish. Perish meaning you're going into the lake of fire. When God judges you, you're done. So if you're doing the magic dance, uh, doing healing services, selling $15 oil, or you're a guy on TV with a beard uh, saying, send me a thousand bucks and uh, God will just, just pour out the blessings on you and all this kind of stuff. You're in for some, uh, you're in for some really bad awakenings when it happens that you have to confront God. Just saying, just going by the Bible, not making fun of anybody. Okay, 
God authorized, God says only I can do this, but I'm authorizing some people like my son Jesus. And when Jesus came along, Jesus knew he was going back to heaven, so he said, I'm going to authorize my apostles, and I'm going to authorize them because I'm going to have all the gifts that I have, um, and, and I'll even throw in a few extra ones so that they can, so that the people around them can see through their credentials, which is they have the power to raise from the dead, they have the power to heal the sick, they have the power to walk on um, hot coals and not get burned, they have the power to drink any poisonous drink whatsoever, call it antifreeze, call it whatever you want to, they can drink anything and it will not hurt them, they can pick up serpents, deadly rattlesnakes if you will, or cobras, and it will bite them and they will not die. There were some great signs and wonders. Some people today say, well, I have the gift of healing. No, you don't. I'm just saying that God says, no, you don't. He authorized his apostles, that's it. But why they say that they believe they have the gift of healing or the gift of tongues or the gift of this or that or the other thing, the gift of knowledge, the gift of prophecy, is because they were reading, misreading Mark chapter 16, 14. This is where you really ought to get your Bible out. King James Version would be the right one to get out, only because it's clear as a bell. But let me read it to you. Uh, I have to start out in verse 9, and I'm going to get my Bible out here, because it's important to know, starting out in verse 9. Now Jesus was risen, came out of the tomb, uh, early on the first day of the week, Sunday, that would have been April 13, 33 A.D. On Friday, day one, he was crucified. That was April 11th. Saturday went by the 12th. Everything is quiet on the Western Front. Sunday, the third day, the 13th of April, Jesus came walking out of the tomb. And the first one he met there was Mary Magdalene, which it says here. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. See, I don't make this stuff up out of whom he had cast earlier, had cast seven devils out of her. And she went and told them that had been with him, and they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had, seen, had been seen of her, and she talked to him, they, it says here, they believed not. Yeah, sure, Mary. You're hallucinating, girl. That's what they were saying. Now let me paint the picture. There are 11, because Judas was dead, 11 apostles upstairs in the upper room. One of the apostles, Thomas, happened to be downstairs with the crowd of disciples. Now, there are only 12 apostles, I've taught this before, but there are millions of disciples of which you are one and I am one too, if you are believers. You're a disciple, which means strictly and only a follower of Christ. Okay, so a bunch of disciples were outside, Mary comes running up says, I have seen Jesus and I've spoken to him. And they all did not believe, according to that verse. Now, let me paint, let me keep going. After that appeared another, uh, Jesus appeared, it goes on to say that Jesus appeared to two men walking down uh, on a road to Emmaus, starting with an E. Um, and that's seven miles out of Jerusalem. So he's walking along with these two men. The two men's names are, one is Cleopas, C-L-E-O-P-A-S, the other is unnamed anywhere in the Bible. So he's unnamed, but I know he's not an apostle, because pretty soon it says, none of the apostles believed that Jesus was alive. These two did, because they saw him, they spoke with him, they ate with him. And then he left and went back to Jerusalem, he, Jesus, now he's going to appear to his 11 apostles upstairs in the upper room. So let me uh, read that for you now out of the Bible. Let me pull it over here so you can see my smiling little face. It says, Afterward he appeared unto the 11, 11 what? Apostles. As they sat eating, and he scolded them. He upbraided them, it says. He scolded them. He chastised them. Why? because of their unbelief and their hardness of the, their heart. Why did he do that? Because before he went to the cross, he said to his apostles, look, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to die. 
I'm also going to be resurrected, just like I showed you when I resurrected Lazarus. Remember, Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus, you guys were with me at his tomb, and I shouted out to the tomb four days after he died, and the Bible said Lazarus stinks, he's not dead, and he came forth out of that grave. I raised him from the dead. Why would you not believe, he's saying now, why would you not believe that I was telling you the truth, that I would raise, be raised from the dead myself, and I told you that I would meet you up in the hills of Galilee, and here you are, you guys, cowering like little cowards, up in the upper room, locked behind locked doors, hiding from the uh, people who put me on the cross. You're, you're, you're hiding up here. You're afraid. You didn't believe. I told you these things were going to happen, and yet you didn't believe. So he's chewing them out for that. And he says, uh, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So Jesus is chewing them out for that too. He says, look, Mary showed up down below. Thomas was there. He didn't say it that here, but he, the implication is Thomas was there. And I know because I read it over in John chapter 20. But suffice it to say, he said, even though Mary said she spoke with me and saw me and told you, you still wouldn't believe, even though I told you, even though Mary, a witness, told you, and even though those two guys that I was walking with on the road to Emmaus are down there now, because they came back and told the disciples, we have seen and spoken with Jesus, you still don't believe. You don't believe, and he chewed them out for their unbelief. Let me keep going because it's very important. And it has to do with healing. And he said to them, um, he said to them, the eleven, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, my brother was here at my house the other night. Uh, excuse me, I met in this beautiful studio. Or, uh, yeah, that's it. And he was saying, yeah, but that's the, the uh, mission that he gave to all of us. We're supposed to go and into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, that's true. We're supposed to go and make disciples of men. That is a commandment in the New Testament. But he was referring to Matthew 28, the last three verses. But in two verses above that, I said, Bob, you didn't read this part where it says, And the eleven went with Jesus to Galilee, and he spoke to them and gave them this same charge that he's given here. Why it's in Matthew is, remember, Matthew is an apostle. He's sitting in there with the eleven. He also wrote the book of Matthew. We're reading in Luke. So Luke, who was not an apostle, just a physician and a friend of Jesus, um, wrote this account right here. Uh, excuse me, Mark, which is John Mark, who happens to have been a disciple, not an apostle, but a disciple of Paul. Paul came after Jesus was re resurrected and went to heaven. I know I'm confusing you, but it's okay. Whether it's Mark writing it here in Mark 16, or whether it's Matthew, it's the same exact wording and the same exact account. Very important to know. And then Jesus says, He now go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. That means to you and to me, through His Word now. Um, and he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that does not believe shall be damned, which means, unfortunately, those who don't believe that Jesus went to the cross, died on the cross for their sins, uh, he's the only one that can forgive their sins and save them, those people will be damned and sent into a place of torment forever when they die in a place called the lake of fire and hell. Okay. And these signs, now this is very important because this is where everybody seems to mess up. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them, they shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. See, we're talking about people that can lay hands on somebody and be healed. That's what we're talking about. And after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Now, just so you know, that's true. That was the first day of, of uh, his resurrection, Sunday, April 13th of 33 AD. This is important too. And I've studied this out so I can tell you that 
it's the truth. And you can research it yourself and you'll find out. I'm telling, I don't tell you anything that's not in this Bible. I don't make the stuff up. But anyway, it's true. He did ascend into heaven then. And he was gone for seven whole days. Then, he's telling where he's gone. He's gone to sit at the right hand side of the Father. Now, the reason that he uh, is going to heaven is when Mary came out of the tomb, uh, she went to touch him and he said, Don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. So now he's making good on that. You can't, nobody can touch him for whatever reason. I don't know, the Bible doesn't say. He goes to heaven for seven days, and on the eighth day, the Bible records that he returned to the upper room, talked to his 11 apostles again. This time, Doubting Thomas was upstairs with them, as he was at the first meeting in Mark here, when Jesus said, none of you believe. And they still didn't believe, but he said to Thomas at that point, on the second time, which is April 21st, 33 AD, on a Monday, he said to them, Thomas, you're the one, because Jesus knows what was said outside to the disciples when Mary and the other two witnesses came and said, we have seen and spoken to Jesus. And Thomas, you said, I will not believe until I can put my finger into his uh, hands and, and thrust my hand into his side where he was wounded. So he said, Thomas, come on up here now. See, now that Jesus was back from the Father, he had ascended into heaven for those seven days. For what reason? He doesn't tell us. And then he ends up spending 40 more days with his apostles and with others like Luke and so forth to tell them how and what he wants written as the New Testament, which didn't exist then. Okay, so now I'm just back to that eighth day, the 21st. He tells Thomas, come on, stick your fingers in here. Thomas did it and he says, now I believe. Okay, so now... Uh, now we get back to where some people say, no, when Jesus said, he that believe, uh, no, and these signs shall follow them that believe. That means anybody who believes, right? So then I told my brother Bob and one other guy that just insisted, no, he's talking to us, not to the apostles. And that's why he was saying, some of you will be healed, uh, healers, and some of you will be this. They're confusing that with 1 Corinthians. Let's stick in Mark 16 here. Now, let me just show you how foolish it sounds now when I actually absolutely put their concept of what they think that Jesus is talking to you or me because we believe, right? So now let me put it into that perspective. Uh, and these signs shall follow John Tyler or you because you guys believe these are the signs that will follow you guys in my name. You shall, you John, or you out there listening to me, you shall cast out devils. I can't cast out devils. I know you can't. Some of you claim you can. A friend of mine claims he can. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Yet Paul in 1 Corinthians, and I just did this message last week, says, no, that's going to end when the New Testament is written, when that which is completed or perfect comes. That was the New Testament, which they didn't have any books. They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. None of the books, prophecy, none of the revelation, nothing was written in. So Paul says to them, when this uh, ends, you shall, um, so shall tongues, prophecy, and the word of knowledge. But let me go back to Mark 16 and verse 17. If Jesus is promising you and me, then we shall uh, speak with new tongues. All of us. In Corinthians, Paul says, some of you have been given the gift of tongues, which was true at the time. Some of you have been given the gift of prophecy, which is true at that time. Some of you have been given, in this church at Corinth and elsewhere in the new churches, have been given the gift of the word of knowledge. All that was true until Paul says, when the New Testament comes, that's done away with. But we're back here. So if Jesus is talking to you and me and not his apostles who did not believe, then what he's saying to us is, you will speak, you will all speak with new tongues. Whoever believes shall cast out devils. Whoever believes will take up deadly serpents and get bitten. And if you, whoever believes, if you drink 
antifreeze, a whole glass. And I challenged my friend, come on, I'll pour the glass of antifreeze out of my garage. I got plenty of it. I'll watch you drink it and I'll hang out with you for a while. We'll just see what happens. You know, if you walk out of here, no problem. And he wouldn't do it. I said, what's the matter? Don't you have the faith? If you claim that Jesus gave those that believe those gifts, why wouldn't you just drink the antifreeze? Uh, he comes up with a million cockamamie excuses. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. Anybody who believes can lay hands on the sick, if that's what Jesus was saying. And, he says, they shall recover. That means that you, my friend, if you believe, and you believe that Jesus was talking to you and me, we should be able to go down to the local hospital and just, for free, we're not charging, and just lay our hands on people that are sick, and they shall recover. That's what Jesus promised, right? According to some of these people who believe he was talking to them. That's how ridiculous that is. He was talking to the whole first part of Mark 16, from 14 through 20, is Jesus is chewing them, them out for their unbelief. So now he says, uh, and these signs shall follow those that believe. He's talking about those of you, 11 apostles, who believe, then these signs and wonders shall uh, take place. Now, why he said that, and we're talking about healing still, so I've got to give you the flavor of because you got to know who can heal, who can't heal. Um, so anybody that the apostles authorized or laid their hands on, Jesus says, I give you my authority and my power for you, or anybody that you should lay your hands on. And he also gave the same power and authority to Paul, his 12th apostle. But now I have to just tell you that of the 12 apostles, only, uh, let's see, uh, Five, plus the Apostle Paul later on, only five ended up actually believing and following Christ. And the other six apostles, six of the original apostles, disappeared off the face of the earth and you never hear from them again. Although they are promised by Jesus that they will sit on one of the 24 thrones for the elders. The elders in heaven, when we get there, you will see that 12 seats are occupied by the tribal leaders of the nation of Israel. The other 12, same with the foundations, were named after the apostles, the 12 foundations in heaven. But the other 12 thrones or seats in heaven are occupied by the 12 apostles, including the six that just plain, they didn't do anything, they didn't write any books, they didn't go preach, they didn't heal anybody. You never hear from them again. So, um, let me just... See if I can find those guys. Uh, you know what? That was in another article that I did. So, so I just suffice it to say for now uh, that only five of the originals. I may, I can probably remember them. Matthew went on to. He was an apostle. He went on to do great things. He wrote the book of Matthew. Peter. Peter wrote. Peter was a preacher, he was an apostle. All of these guys were prophets. These five guys left. Peter was a prophet. He preached at the churches. Uh, they didn't have the New Testament then. And he would expound things from God that God told him to say. And then he would later write them down in uh, 1 and 2 Peter. So he also was participation, uh, participant in writing the New Testament. So we have Matthew, Peter... We have Mark, uh, who wrote the book of Mark, but that was John Mark, who was, as I say, a disciple of Paul, who would come later. Paul was an apostle, but not one of the originals, and he wrote, I forget how many books, but a whole bunch of them. Uh, Romans, Corinthians, 1st and 2nd, uh, Ephesians, Galatians, Thessalonians, Philippians. He even wrote the book of 1st and 2nd Timothy, and so on and so forth. So Paul was a a huge asset to the Gentiles, that's you and me, unless you're Jewish. Uh, and he wrote a lot of things. There was Jude, was one of the original apostles. His name was really Thaddeus. And the Bible goes on to say, the book of Jude is the little teeny book, I think there's 25 verses in it, just in front of Revelation. And it says in the first verse, I, Jude, the brother of James. Well, 
This was also James, the same James that was the half-brother of Jesus, but that's how Jude or Thaddeus described himself. So those three and two additional ones, I don't know what escapes me right now, but anyway, only five of the original apostles went on to do great things. Philip, that was another one, sorry. The Bible says that he also went preaching and healing people. So he was granted these gifts. Paul, later on, was one that picked up a serpent, by the way. It bit him, and the people were shocked that he didn't die. He just shook it off. So these gifts that God promised his apostles, or anybody that they laid hands on, that's it. There's nobody over here today that could go and lay hands on somebody. They can lay, you can lay hands on people all you want and pray over them. And Jesus, God says, I'm the only one really, or, but he and Jesus are one in the Trinity. I'm the only one that can cause people to have illness, or I'm the only one that can heal them. So, uh, the healing oil. Let me get to that. Well, before I do that, let me just say, and then I can close this out fairly quickly, I think. Uh, most of us don't actually turn to the Lord, which is His intent, and that's why we end up with illnesses or accidents or whatever happens. He says He causes it. Why? For His glory. Why? Uh, so that the people that are injured or their loved ones will come seek Him out. And uh, some of the criteria for that include if you're going to seek Him out for healing, you can't just run up and say, uh, well, Lord, my daughter is ill, would you please heal her? Because He isn't going to heal you. The reason I say that is because the Bible says so. God says if you regard iniquity or sin in your heart, if you haven't confessed your sins to Him, 1 John 1, 9, and you just come to Him like, hey, God, you know, my daughter's sick, and, you know, I'm praying, I'm meeting the requirement, you said pray, I'm praying that my daughter is sick. But in the other part of the Bible, he says, whoever regards iniquity in their heart, I will not hear their prayer. So he's not hearing that prayer. He wants to develop a relationship with you and with your sick daughter or son or whoever it happens to be, mother or whatever. Um, he wants to develop that relationship. So how serious are you to be healed or to... Uh, Pray fervently that somebody that you know would be healed. That anointing oil, it says, that, are there any sick among you? Let him bring that, uh, that sick one to the elder, which means pastors of the church, not deacons. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the pastor will anoint their head with oil. Why? Now that whole rigmarole for healing there is for a specific reason. One is the pastor's heart has to be clean before the prayer will be answered. Your heart has to be clean before the prayer will be answered. The person who's sick has to have the faith enough to believe that God will heal them, so therefore they're coming with the belief that God can heal them, but God wants them to be also saved or born again. Otherwise, he says, I will not hear the prayers of those that I don't know that have not accepted my son as their savior. You just won't hear their prayers because they're living in their sins. And if they regard sin in their heart, I will not hear you. So there's, a, there's all that stuff that's involved in healing. But what do we do? We don't run to God when we're ill. We don't actually, I don't know how very few of us probably even take it to that next level of going to the church, asking the pastor to pray for us, repenting of our sins before we can even ask that prayer, making sure that the pastor or pastors of the church, the elders, uh, are right with God, and a lot of them are not. So everybody has to be right with God, including the injured one or the sick one, and then God will hear the prayer, and He may or may, he may decide to heal them. He may not decide to heal them, after all, uh, Illness is what causes eventual death. So whoever dies, you know, they either get hit by a car or they had cancer or they had a brain tumor or they had an aneurysm, something, kidney disease, kidney failure, something, something happened where their body broke down from an illness 
and they die and we all die. Okay, so instead of going to God though, like his intent was way back when I first started this message, where Jesus says it's all for the glory of God, that he might be made manifest through you or your sickness or your daughter's or son's sickness or your mother's sickness or all that kind of stuff. So focus your attention on him and then he uh, can take care of the situation. <coughs> Excuse me. Gloria, I forgot my water today. But what we do is we run to the doctor. Nothing wrong with running to the doctor, but here's the problem with that, that I see. I don't take, um, I take maybe one med plus an aspirin and vitamins and stuff like that. And I'm still alive. Um, but what we do is we, we run off to get like uh, Paxil. Ever hear of that? It's sort of an antidepressant. That's what it was, it's made for uh, by GlaxoSmithKline. Okay, that's going to settle you down and make you not depressed. The only problem with that is that all those millions of people, I think it was 700, no, 19.7 million, I'm reading it, Paxil prescriptions were made. 19.7 million. I don't know how much money that is, but it's a whole bunch. The only problem with Paxil or running to get a quick cure with a pill for our illness instead of going to God is that all the lawyers are suing Paxil because of the side effects, which include, let me read them, withdrawal symptoms, primary pulmonary hypertension, high blood pressure, death by development of coronary artery disease as a result of Paxil, severe allergic reactions, bizarre behavior, chest tightness, seizures, restlessness, suicidal tendencies, birth injuries, unusual bleeding, bruising, vision changes, pregnancy risks. So the benefit of Paxil that we run to quickly, oh yeah, give me some of that. That's my cure. Don't go to God. Go run off to get that drug. I'm not saying, you know, your doctor shouldn't prescribe them, but when you finish hearing what I have to say, maybe you'll be thinking twice about running off to the doctor who's also been programmed, you know, sent off to the country club, look, sell this stuff and we'll cut you in and you can buy stock in it, and whatever. Be careful, is what I'm telling you, and so is the Bible. Now, um, we have also chosen Avandia, those of us, and I don't include me, but those of us on the planet that have type 2 diabetes, obesity, that type of an illness, what do we do? We run off to Avandia. Uh, the same maker of Paxil who's being sued is being sued under the Avandia label because it was supposed to prevent type 2 diabetes. Instead, they're being sued, sued because that cure-all pill uh, causes heart attack, stroke, congestive heart failure, liver failure, bone fractures, uh, macular edema, which is vision loss, and heart-related deaths. So hey, you, you blow off that type 2 diabetes, that might not have killed you for a drug that will kill you. You know what? I don't mean to laugh because a lot of people unfortunately have been uh, are dead because of this running off to the pill instead of to the Lord. Now, Sally Fields, the flying nun. Who cannot believe the flying nun? She's on TV a couple of years ago saying Boniva, the once a month thing that's going to cure all of your, let's see, it was good for, uh, to prevent osteoporosis in women who are older, you know, past, uh, post-menopausal women. So it's going to cure osteoporosis. Well, <clears throat> a lot of this stuff we didn't even know existed until Sally Fields told us it would. And there's a saying out there, which I'll read to you, I think, shortly, that says, you know, create the disease... The, the medical manufacturers, the pharmaceuticals, create the disease, then sell the cure, which is exactly what they're doing. <clears throat> so here we go, Boniva, and also Fosamax. I know you heard of that. You don't see the ads anymore. Why? Because they pulled it off the market. And they're being sued too because it causes femur fractures, bone fractures. Esophageal, esophageal cancer it causes. Uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw, your jaw starts deteriorating. 
atrial fibrillation. If you know now, there's another pill to cure that, atrial fib, caused by a Vandia. And severe musculoskeletal pain. We run to the pill instead of running to the ward. So, uh, it does say, and I just can't find it now because i got so many pages here and I want to try to shorten this, but it does say <clears throat> what I just said, but it bears worth repeating, <clears throat> that there are, the medical profession, meaning pharmaceutical manufacturers, say create the disease and then create the cure. You've heard of RLS, just came out, I saw it on TV uh, a couple of years ago. Do you have restless leg syndrome? Well, we got a cure for that disease that didn't exist until we told you it did. You, your lower legs bothering you like a lot of people do. Run off and get that pill, man. And even though later on, who's to say, you might have to find a lawyer because, you know, you took the pill and now you got, you know, three horns coming out of the side of your head. Whatever. So, what I'm trying to tell you is that there are so many uh, diseases that they are now creating in your mind so that you have to run off. I think the last one I saw was, uh, I'll hold up my, my, my pen so I can look official. You know, put the doctor thing, stethoscope on. Uh, have you had chicken pox when you were a child? Well, if so, uh, you may have the shingles virus in you. One of three patients, uh, one of three people will end up with shingles. And it's painful. It's a horrible disease. But we have a cure. Boom. This is all brand new stuff. I had chicken pox when I was a kid. But they're hoping I'm going to run to my doctor and say, Look, can you just check me out for you know, I don't want to get the shingles thing. One out of three people, geez, that's one out of three, man. If you get sick, my first thing that I would say to you, recommend, is you go to the Lord with a clean heart, ask Him to forgive you of your sins, ask Him to cure whatever's wrong with you. And I can't tell you how many times I've done that when I, you know, got a little jolt here and then, uh-oh, what am I having, a heart attack or... I had stomach pains for two or three days or whatever. Uh, I could have run to the doctor and you say, well, you should have, you fool. But you know what? I ran over to my little bench in my office and I sought out the great physician. And I have to tell you, everything has gone away. My last physical was about three weeks ago and the doctor threw me out of the place after he did all my blood tests and whatnot. I said, John, you're fine. See you in six months. Get out of here. You're going to live forever. Might drop dead tomorrow. Don't know. Can't say. It is appointed unto man once to die, Hebrews 9.27. Okay, let me continue on with this verse from Hosea. That's an Old Testament prophet, chapter 5, verse 15. Uh, God says this, I will go, I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offenses, their sins, and seek my face in their affliction, in their illness, in their sickness. In their affliction, they will seek me early. That's what God is trying, I keep trying to say, that's what this healing thing is all about. God causes and creates the sicknesses and the illnesses or whatever to get your undivided attention focused on Him. He wants that relationship with you. Uh, he really does. The next, very next verse in Hosea, chapter 6, verse 1, says, For it is He, God, who wounded us, and He will heal us. He hath smitten us, and He will bind us up. More proof that God causes these things to happen, and He wants to get your attention um, for those reasons. The, uh, why, the, uh, why the anointing oil, by the way, that is talked about in uh, James, the book of James? Um, he, he says you know, anoint them with oil. Well, that actually came out of Exodus 28, 41. And it says, And you shall anoint them and consecrate them, sanctify them, that they may minister unto me. So that's all that is, is a symbol. It's, there's nothing about the oil that's going to heal you. The prayer of the faith shall save the sick, is what that verse says. 
But why the oil? It's the same thing as they did in an Exodus. That is, once they pray over you, then anoint you with oil because you have met the requirement of uh, getting your heart right with God, of asking Him to forgive you of your sins, so as the elder of the church, and so have you, if you happen to be an elder with them, uh, or you're there praying with them, and the elder lays his hands on that sick one and does the prayer and then anoints them with oil, it's sort of like saying the same thing. Anointing them consecrates them or dedicates that ill one now that they prayed over you or that one who's sick, your loved one. Now that they prayed over them, they anointed them with oil. It's consecrating them or setting them aside, sanctifying them for use by the Lord that they may minister and worship God and be a minister of God to other people. Do you meet that requirement as well? Because if you really want to get healed, you got to meet these criteria set forth by God in His Word. David said in Psalm 32, O Lord my God, I cried unto you, and you heard me, and you have healed me. David was ill as well. He said again in Psalm 103, 2 and 3, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits, who forgives all your sins and who heals all your diseases. God is the one who brings the disease or the illness. He's the one that heals it. But you have to meet the certain criteria. If you want, you can take the easy way out. You can send 15 bucks to the guy on TV. He'll send you a bottle of useless oil, which means absolutely nothing. And he'll be rich and you'll be wet with oil. You know, use it for you something, I guess. So, that's what you can do. Or you can actually believe what the Bible says about uh, healing. So that's it. Uh, God wants to use the healing to manifest the results of that healing. If everybody's honest and forthright and free of sin while you're praying over that person or having them pray over you, and then anointing you with that oil to um, signify that you're going to be set apart for worshiping God and for ministering the gospel of God to others and developing that relationship with them. So healing is not some quickie fix, slap on the head, anoint with oil, and you're done. Uh, so that's it, and I will see you next week. I'm fully convinced in the healing thing, and who can heal and who cannot, who has the gifts, who does not, and by now I hope that you are too. But what I say to you, you just have to take it as a grain of salt and say, yeah. Or you can say, you know what, he didn't read anything but the Bible, so then you have to take it all in and figure it out for yourself. I'll see you next week, don't know what the message will be, but I'll see you then. Take care.